Start with the white. And we are here. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to worship with United Manchac United Methodist Church. My name is Chanson, and today we're going to worship God. We're going to worship God together. If you're online watching in the present moment or in the future, you're watching with us, those who are here in person. Um, it's good to be alive. We're praying for health for our people and uh, just safety and health during this time. If you are worshiping online, make sure you say hello in the chat box so that we can know that you're with us. We're in a series called God's Round Table, and you'll hear more about that in a little while. You'll be hearing from Pastor David preach about God's Round Table. And one of our small groups is actually starting today called God's Round Table, and Kim will be leading that on Zoom at 4. We have another small group starting today at 3, and that will be on Deuteronomy with uh, Pastor David as well as his son, who's a pastor at another church. So you can join a new small group on Zoom today at 3 or at 4. And next week at the 9 o'clock service will be Pet Guest Sunday. Every final Sunday of the month, every last Sunday of every month this year, we're inviting your pets to come and worship with us at 9 o'clock in the Family Life Center. And so if that sounds fun, which I think it's fun, bring your dogs and and I want to pet them, and <laughs> we'd love to see them and worship together. Dogs get into it, too. So that'll be next week at 9 a.m. The week after that, we are doing Kidding. Breakfast Church. So Kidding. as we're doing a series called um, God's Round Table, there will be round, well, there'll be probably rectangle tables, but there <laughs> will be tables in here, and there will be some food, and if you want to participate in that, come at 9 o'clock, uh, February 9th. 6th, February 6th at 9. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the, the music of the morning. So rise if you can and let's sing.
seated. had promised us that we were going to have a party where we could watch a movie. <clears throat> and we were all very excited about this. And so we had been waiting for a movie. So on the week before the party, one of our fellow students, Jordan Hughes, had broken into class and used some of the materials in the science room and had made kind of a mess. And as you can imagine, the teacher wasn't very happy about that and decided to cancel our party that we had been looking forward to for weeks. So how do you think everyone felt about missing out on this party? And how do you think we all felt about the students that caused us to miss out on this party? Let's just say we weren't happy with them and, and some people kind of got a little mean about it. And this reminds me of our Bible story today because in this story there was a woman who broke one of the religious laws and the punishment for this law, to break, for breaking this law, was that people could throw stones at her until she died. Is that not the most horrible thing ever? And so this crowd of people brought this woman to Jesus, to the temple, to see what Jesus would do. Would Jesus let her get away with breaking the law, or would Jesus allow them to do this horrible punishment? Well, luckily, Jesus was a smart man and a compassionate man, and he looked at her, and he, he was not going to let that happen. And so he told the crowd, if any of you have never broken a law, then you can be the first one to throw a stone. And so one by one, the crowd left. They all went away because they all realized that each of them at some point in their lives had made a mistake. They had each broken a rule. They had each broken one of the religious laws, just like all of us do. We all make mistakes sometimes. And Jesus realized that um, it, they couldn't throw stones because they also had messed up before. So I wonder, if you had been in that crowd, would you have been able to throw a stone? Probably not. They came there wanting punishment, but Jesus stood up and made them see that that violence and that punishment was not the answer. So let's pray and give thanks to God for this story that reminds us that we all mess up and we all make mistakes. And so we should all have compassion for one another and forgive one another. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. And thank you for forgiving us when we mess up. Help us to forgive others when they mess up too. Amen. What a joy it is that we as a community of faith can come together to lift up our celebrations and concerns. If you have a celebration and concern and you are watching with us on Facebook Live, feel free to uh, enter that concern or celebration in uh, the chat box. You can also e direct message us as well, and that we can get it that way. Uh, also, at any time during the, the week or any time you, you're on the website, you can go to the ministry tab under the caring link. You can fill out a virtual prayer card. So let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, Jesus said that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. We praise you and we thank you for his purpose in coming. And we pray to you that we might indeed experience the fullness of the life that he has promised us. Take from us, O oh Lord, all those things that get in the way of our relationship with you, our pride and self-certainty, 
our doubt and our fear and all those things that come from our human nature that blind us to the wonders of your presence and the glory of what you are doing in our midst. Lord, you know very well how our traditions and our understandings can become instruments of judgment rather than tools of your grace. We pray today, O oh God, for all those who have been hurt by our careless insistence that our particular way is the right way. Touch the hearts of those who have turned away from you because we have caused your light within us to grow dim. Lord, brighten our souls, we pray. We thank you for the refreshing wind of your spirit, for how you breathe into us new life and new hope and lead us to new understandings. In you, we find wholeness of both body and soul. We pray now, O oh God, that this wholeness may not only grow within us, but that it might enter into and transform the lives of those whom we name silently before you at this time. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior and Redeemer, our brother and our friend. Amen. Hi. Hi, y'all. <laughs> and now, if you would, if you're able and willing, get back up on your feet. And let's take a second to just shake off all that would keep us from being fully present in this moment and worshiping. As the Spirit was moved over the water, the Spirit come move over us. Come rest on Come rest on us as the spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me.
Awesome God, send your spirit here. Let your power flow over, in, and through us, empowering us to spread your love and mercy far and wide. Lord, you know this world is broken, full of suffering and pain. So much of that is caused by our own brokenness and fear, fear of being different, fear of others' differences. Help us lean into your love that covers all, no matter what. Help us see that in your love there are no outsiders, that we are all your children, worthy because you love us. In the name of your Son, who came to demonstrate and give all for that love, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.
this morning. We continue uh, looking at a series we started last week uh, called God's Round Table. And so the image is a table that is round because everyone is uh, equal. There are places for everyone. It is open. It is inclusive. And we, want, we started thinking about what prevents us from having that table last week, and we talked about the power of groupthink, that oftentimes the tribe that we're a part of leads us to prejudge or take certain uh, positions, and uh, we looked at that. But this week, we want to look at the antidote, in a sense, to uh, groupthink, and that would separate us one from another. And to do that, we will look at the scripture this morning of the woman caught in the act of adultery. It's John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Then each of them went home, while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. While they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on do not sin again. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I remember my second grade year as a very scary year in uh, elementary school as a young student. And a couple of things that still stand out so many 60 years later about that uh, scary time were, first of all, we had air raid drills. Did you have air raid drills and you had to get under um, uh, the desk? Only later would I realize that we were in Florida, which when I was growing up, which was like ground zero for during the Cuban Missile Crisis while this was going on. That was pretty scary. But what was more unsettling was something that happened as often and maybe even more often than the air raid drill. And that was the teacher would leave the room, hand a piece of chalk to one of the students and say, here, I want you to take names in case anybody misbehaves while I'm gone. And that was terrifying to me because you didn't know if uh, you would get called down when you really didn't do anything wrong. And when your name went on the board, I knew where it went next. It was going to my mother because she was a teacher in the same school. And that was terrifying. You know, I've never really liked the taking of names. And yet it seems that history, at least American history, seems to have a special place for taking names. Remember Senator Joseph McCarthy and his uh, witch hunt for communists, and he produced names of those who supposedly were communists. And you'll remember the Hollywood uh, blacklisting of folks. And then as we went forward a couple dec decades, we got to President Nixon. And during his time, we come to find out that he had taken names. He had an enemies list that he was trying to um, uh, undo or come against. And then as we come forward, we find that uh, President Trump, who uh, left office and not thinking he should have had to leave office, then began taking names for those who had voted against him and certified the person who had uh, won the election. And then President Biden is recently, as this week, even though the Voting Rights Act was uh, doomed to failure, he insisted on having the vote anyway because, remember, he wanted everybody's names down where they stood on the issue. But my favorite taking names was a woman I actually worked on a church staff with for a number of years. In her carol, she kept her own list of names, both lay people and other staff who had crossed her. Now, we never knew how or when she would get back at us, but we knew because we could walk by the carol and see our names, we knew our names had been taken down. Well, thankfully this morning, I would like to tell you that the Bible is beyond taking names. 
I mean, other than finding your name in the book of life, which is a good thing. I'd like to tell you that. But actually, there's a fairly prominent verse in Jeremiah 17, uh, verse 13, where God says, those uh, who, um, who have um, uh, fallen away and, uh, and from me, their names will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the stream of living water. Right there it says, God's taking names. Turn away and abandon God's ways and you find your name written down. But it gets worse. It's quite possible in our story this morning that Jesus himself, when he bends down on the ground, is actually taking names. Well, let, let me tell you how I got there uh, and why I think this might be so. First of all, the setting of uh, the woman caught in adultery is John 8, but it follows on the heels of John 7, which is a major festival called the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles. It's one of the three big blowouts that the Jews would have every year. Uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people would descend upon Jerusalem in Jesus' day. And for that time, even like today, um, the Jews would live in tents as a way of reminding themselves that when they were wandering in the wilderness and had no permanent dwelling, God took care of them. But it was a double-sided um, uh, festival. They not only remembered their dependence on God, but it was also because of that dependence that they would call on God for rains so that they could have crops for the next year. And for seven days in a row, they would parade around uh, chanting for rains, and they would take palm branches and beat them on the ground. And if you've ever heard a bunch of palm branches beating at one time, you realize that's like the sound of a rainstorm. And they would do that for seven days. And then on the eighth day, the, the priest uh, himself would wander around and come and pour an empty cup over the altar. And of course, everybody would be, oh, and then he would go back and refill it from like the pool, I think, of, of, of Siloam and come back and pour it out o over the altar. And the crowd would erupt as they asked God for rain for that um, coming year. Now that's going on, and while this is going on, they're reading all sorts of passages about living water, including Jeremiah 17. It's fresh in their memory. But that's not the only thing going on. Anytime you get 100,000 or more people together for, uh, for a party, well, there's going to be uh, lots of activity, including lots of wine. And uh, it is quite possible that drinking too much, partying too much, uh, being in this strange situation... A woman found herself and a man found themselves in tents where they didn't belong. And they are caught in the act, and the woman is brought um, during the festival before Jesus. And they say to Jesus, now Moses commands us in Leviticus and Deuteronomy uh, to stone uh, such people to death who are caught in adultery. What do you say? Well, in the immortal words of Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. And the trap is this, that if Jesus says, yeah, stoner, then Jesus is going to bring the Romans down on his head because they did not have permission to execute without, uh, without the Ro Romans. They didn't have the authority to do that. But, if, he's, but uh, if he says don't do anything, then he's against the law of Moses, which commands stoning. So there's the trap. And in the midst of this trap, Jesus bends down on the ground and starts writing What's he doing? A lot of possibilities. One is Jesus is just sort of killing time, giving people a moment to sort of come to their senses. And maybe you've even done that in the past, um, where you'll like kind of call time out on yourself or another person, just see if things can get back under control. Did your parents ever tell you when you were angry, you should always count to 10, right? Or some would say three, but, but you would count. So maybe Jesus is <clears throat> giving them a chance to count. He's counting. That's possible. Another possibility is maybe Jesus is writing in the ground the things for which they are, of which they are accused. The woman, of course, would be accused of breaking the seventh commandment. The crowd, the Pharisees and scribes, would be accused of um, breaking the law because they didn't produce the man. They only produced the woman, and you're supposed to produce both of them. 
Another possibility is Roman judges in that day would write out the sentence in a case and then hand it like to a bailiff or somebody like that to read the sentence. We, now ours, the jury like writes it out in a sense and gives it the judge who reads it. And so uh, the, the judge would always write out the sentence. And so perhaps Jesus is writing out the sentence in this situation, guilty or not guilty or acquitted, or maybe just maybe since they all probably within the last 24 hours have again heard Jeremiah 17, those who abandon me and will have their names written in the dust because they have forsaken the living stream of water. And maybe that's what he's writing in the dust is the names of all of those who have forsaken God's ways by wanting to kill this woman. And so we know, whatever it is, they they get up and start to walk away. Now, granted, Jesus also, as Kim reminded us, said, now, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. Well, they probably um, all knew they were sinners. And uh, some uh, people say, really, the intent of that is, even among you sinners, which of you really think this is what God wants? If you think God's what God wants, and you think you'd be without sin by doing this, pick up a rock. If you think you can do this without, without being in the wrong, pick up a rock. And of course, they couldn't. And so they walked away. And this is, to me, an amazing, amazing thing that Jesus has done, has saved this woman's life. But there's more. What he's done, he's also, by writing in the dust, uh, and remember Jews, they know their Bible, they also know the pictures in the Bible, they would go back and think of the first time they ever saw dust in the Bible. You can probably think of it. Who was made of dust? Adam. And one of the things they're reminded of is we were all come from Adam. We're all human. We all make mistakes. We're all related to one another. Scribes, Pharisees, crowd, woman caught in adultery and reminds them of their essential connection. Uh, And then, even better, by writing in the dust, what happens when the wind blows? Dust is gone. The names are erased. Have you ever um, written something in the sand at the beach and come back to see if it was there the next day? Combination of sand and wind? It's probably not. And so it was a way not only of talking about their essential connection to each other, but also their impermanence. But not just the impermanence of their life, but the impermanence, I believe, of their guilt. Yeah, I'll write the names in the dust, but it's not going to stay there. The woman is forgiven, neither do I condemn you, go and and sin no more. And neither is the crowd condemned. Their names, though written down, are wiped away the next time the wind comes up. And so Jesus frees and forgives both of them. The woman is free, she's, she's able to live, but the Pharisees and the crowd are free too because they don't have an innocent person's life on their hand as they leave. It is, to me, an amazing and brilliant stroke of one person standing up, saving a life, and yet at the same time setting people free and allowing them to know they're forgiven. And yet, I think something else is going on here. In the law of Moses, there are 36 crimes for which you could uh, receive the death penalty. But we know by the days of Jesus... It was rare, if ever, that anyone was ever executed. In fact, there's a famous saying that says, any Sanhedrin, the group of 70 people that ran Jerusalem uh, with Roman permission, that condemns more than one person to death every seven years needs to go back and read the Bible. They allowed for the capital punishment to stay on the books, but they simply, if you don't mind me saying, they didn't execute it. And if they did, the understanding was they'd messed up. There was something wrong. It was a clear message that violence was not the solution. And Jesus is showing them pointedly that violence is not the solution in this case. I saw something on PBS a few weeks ago, and it was about the um, radical groups that we have in America that want to overthrow or they would say restore government or or whatever. And they talked about the group of people. Do you remember the folks that were plotting to kidnap the governor of Michigan? at her vacation home, then take her, put her on trial, and then in front of everyone, pronounce her guilty and execute her. Well, of course, the uh, plot was broken up. 
and they came to the house of one uh, man who was arrested in a plot, and they talked to his wife, and she said, first she said, well, I really can't comment because, you know, this is a legal matter. I'm not going to say anything, but she couldn't resist. And then she said, but you know what? When you ask me about the violence and the plans for violence, I want to tell you it's there in the Bible. Just go read your Bible. I went, say what? There is some violence in the Bible. But the clear message in the Bible, when you go all the way through, which Jesus is demonstrating this morning, is violence will never solve anything. Not violence of words, not violence of action. Violence would not have solved the problem of adultery. And violence won't solve the other issues in our midst as well. And Jesus proved this not only at the Feast of Tabernacles, but when he came back later at Passover, he will prove it once and for all. If you want to see the judgment of God against violence, look at the cross. Because rather than institute violence against the Romans, Jesus shows the absurdity of all of it by allowing violence to be done to him. It is God's final word that death is not the last word and violence does not solve anything. And I would suggest that to the extent that you and I fail to forgive those with whom we have difficulty, and to the extent that we resort to violence and action or words, we can be counted among those who have abandoned God and forsaken the stream of living water. And the early Christians knew this. They knew that that was not to be Jesus' way. Famous story took place apparently, and you can Google it and get some different dates, around 391. In other words, uh, you know, 360 or so years after the death of Jesus. There's a monk named Telemachus who's tired of the gratuitous violence at the gladiator games, and so he walks into the arena and tells them to stop the bloodshed. Well, imagine this afternoon in the NFL playoff game if somebody walks into the middle of the game and tells people to quit hitting each other. It doesn't go over well with the players or the fans. And apparently what happened is the fans in the arena picked up stones and hurled them and killed this monk. Now within, who knows, a year, a few years, perhaps as much as a decade, gladiator games were outlawed by the Roman emperor. There are two explanations for that. They're probably both true. One is the Roman emperor heard about this event that they stoned a monk. Christian, now Rome has Christian emperors. The Christian emperor that they stoned a monk so that the games would go on, got disgusted with it and canceled gladiator games forever. The other possibility I've heard is this, that the crowd themselves, some threw stones and killed him and others watched on in horror that they could do such a thing and they got disgusted with each other and with gladiator fights, and walked away to never walk into the arena again. And maybe they're both true. Because one man dared to stand up in the name of forgiveness and in the name of nonviolence and put an end to unforgiveness and violence. Pray with me. God, we are so grateful for Jesus And we're grateful for those who follow after them and take a stand for forgiveness and love and alternative ways of solving differences in your name. Bless us, Lord, that wherever we walk into in the weeks ahead, we might also be instruments of your peace. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen.
We're gonna find we're more alike than we are different. Yeah. Why just kind of see revolutionary? When did we let hate get so ordinary? Let's turn it around, flip the script, judge so lovely. God help us get revolutionary. go from here let the revolution begin so glad that you were with us uh, this morning in person and online and next week we'll continue to talk about uh, the kind of church and the kind of world we believe god envisions and now as you go from here may the grace of our lord jesus christ and uh, the love of god and the communion with the fellow and the fellowship of the holy spirit go with you and be with you today and always go in peace and now let's get up on our feet and go out singing.